I love cooking and I love teaching people how to cook. I've been doing both for 30 years. To cook well, it helps if you love and value food, as that is where it all starts. My approach to cooking is simple and not new. Use the best ingredients you can, get organized and follow the recipe. That way, you'll be sure to get wonderful results. Preparing beetroot doesn't need to be a time-consuming chore, and believe it or not, it is utterly delicious eaten raw. For this salad, we simply peel it, grate it, dress it, and then eat it. I'm going to make a salad of beetroot and goat's cheese here, which I know has become a little bit of a cliche, but still absolutely delicious. So I've got a lovely little selection of beetroot here. Of course, you can boil them, you can roast them, but here we're quite simply going to peel them, grate them and eat them raw. And they're absolutely delicious eaten like that. In some ways, better for you like that than they are when they are cooked. Most people will know the familiar, lovely, beautiful ruby beetroot, as it's called. And uh, when you cut into it, you have the lovely ruby coloured flesh, so that's easily recognisable. I've got a couple of other exotics here. I've got these beautiful golden beetroots. Again, when you cut into these, they have an incredibly rich golden colour, which is fantastic. By the way, they all taste the same, and I think if you tasted these in a blind tasting and you could find a difference, you might be telling a little white lie there, but maybe some people have a more sensitive palate than mine. And this final one is a sort of a magnificent thing. It's sort of streaked with this lovely pink flesh, and this is called a choggia, C-H-O-G-G-I-A, beetroot. So to prepare the beetroot, cut off the top stalk and the little mouse's tail. That's of no advantage to you here. And then using a vegetable peeler, just peel. Then the next step, very simply, is to grate it. Watch your fingers when you're doing this. And I'm grating them on the coarsest part of the grater. And you get these lovely sort of shreds. If you grate it on a finer grater, the beetroot clumps together, so it feels a little bit heavier when you're eating it. So it's funny, even in a simple dish like this, there are subtleties. Why don't I also grate in a little of the golden beetroot, which I have already uh, peeled? Now, we're getting a nice sort of mixed color there. Now, the dressing here is very, very simple. Some extra virgin olive oil, which I just drizzle on. So always with olive oil, put on slightly less than you think you need, because you can always put in a little bit more, but putting in too much just makes it quite simply too oily, simple as that. And lemon. And the combination of good olive oil and lemon is absolutely transformatory in terms of your cooking. You could cook all of your life with just olive oil and lemon and salt and get absolutely fantastic food. So I don't want to make the beetroot too bitter. I just want to bring out the acidity without it being too sharp. So a little like that. As always, a little pinch of salt and some pepper. I'm going to use my hands. And when you use your hands for mixing something beetroot, obviously it's going to stain them slightly. Doesn't bother me too much. But if you're going to a sort of a smart party or something afterwards or just don't want to have red hands, you can pop on a pair of gloves. OK, let's see how that's tasting. It certainly looks right. See the way there's not a pool of oil anywhere. Just taste. Mm, perfect. The next thing I want is the pomegranate. So this wonderful, wonderful fruit, which is used in sweet and savoury cooking. And I'm going to just cut it in half. And that is going to expose the beautiful ruby coloured seeds inside. I mean, it's a really a, just the most fantastic thing. And the easiest way to extract the seeds from the pomegranate is just hold the pomegranate over your fingers like that, just slightly splayed. And then give it a bit of a spanking like that. And you see the seeds start to come out. That should do it. You see the way it's just sort of jeweled with the beetroot there. So I'm going to place a handful of that onto my plate, and that's about enough for a single portion. I'll be able to get another portion out of this. I'm going to sprinkle a few of the little pomegranate seeds round and about. The next thing I want to do is just give my hands a little rinse before I put the final ingredients on. I'm going to put a few little leaves just around the edge just as an embellishment, but also to help to lighten up the beetroot. These are lovely, tiny, tiny little mustard greens. A few walnuts would also be very good here. There's so many things that go really well with beetroot and that also go very well when you introduce a goat's cheese to the equation. OK, our goat's cheese. 
I'm going to slice a single slice of goat's cheese like that. Not too thick, look how beautiful and creamy and soft this goat's cheese is. It's a fresh goat's cheese, so the fresher they are, the softer they are. I'm making a little nest, if you like, for it in there, like that. Then, a little drizzle of honey. Goat's cheese and honey is a match made in heaven, no doubt about it. The sweet honey and the salty, um, full-flavoured goat's cheese. So I'm just going to get a drizzle, and over the whole thing, like that, not too much. Okay, then final little embellishment is a little drizzle of olive oil, like that. A tiny little twist of black pepper and a few more flakes of sea salt. A little bit of crusty bread, could be Irish brown soda bread, or a little bit of sourdough. Just very simple and delicious. This is really good, simple, fast food. Being able to grill or fry successfully is a really crucial technique, and one hopefully that can be approached without fear. Regardless of what you're grilling, there are rules and guidelines, and these will help you to get perfect results. And the T-bone steak we're using in our main course allows me to put those rules into practice. Alongside the fabulous steak, what could be nicer than chips? I'm also going to serve the steak with a salsa verde, and this taste of the Mediterranean alongside the fabulous Irish beef and potatoes, wonderful. We're going to grill a steak next, a fabulous T-bone steak with a little of the sirloin and the fillet. You've got sort of best of both worlds. So we'll talk a little bit more about this really fabulous piece of meat in a moment. But before we do that, I'm going to get some potatoes on to cook because with a grilled steak, I think most people will agree, chips or a potato of some description is really one of the perfect accompaniments. So I'm going to make oven roast chips. So I'm just simply going to cut them into wedges. And I'm cutting them specifically into wedges like that, so they'll all sit with the skin side down. That's going to give me a crispier skin. That's it. So I've got lots of them here ready in my bowl. I've got my oven preheated, and I'm going to use olive oil. Rather than putting the olive oil onto the tray, I put the olive oil onto the potatoes when they're sitting in the bowl. That way I find I use less olive oil. I don't like to season the potatoes until they're pretty much cooked, because if I put on salt and pepper at this stage, they're more likely to stick. If the potatoes stick, it means I'm probably going to lose my lovely crispy skin. Then I rather boringly, but it only takes a moment, like to sit the potatoes skin side down, like that. That way, the part of the potato that you want to get really crispy, the skin, is in contact with the direct heat of the tray. Those go into a hot preheated oven and they should cook away nicely. You can see my oven is nice and hot because I've got a nice head of smoke going on in there. So, the only thing I'm going to do to the steak, what I like to do is have a little look at it and see if I think there's a little bit of excess fat. Perhaps I think you could safely say that there's a little bit of excess fat there, which I'm going to cut off. And you see what I'm doing? I'm just putting it into the bin, into, onto the hot grill pan just to start to let out a little bit of its fat. And you need to have that beautiful marbling because that's going to sort of melt out and leave little air holes of tenderness behind it. What I like to do is to rub it with a cut clove of garlic. So I've got a peeled clove of garlic, and I would just rub the steak lightly like that with the cut clove. Now that's not going to make it taste strongly of garlic, it just seems to improve the flavor of the beef. Now this is important. Pour some olive oil onto your meat, not onto your pan. Spread it with your hands and use the excess on your hands to coat the back of the steak. As you can see, my pan is really hot. That's the key. The other thing you'll notice, I haven't put any salt and pepper on here either. I'm going to wait until the meat is nicely caramelized on both sides before I put the salt and pepper on. Now, when you're grilling, don't play with the meat. Leave it alone, because the meat will tense up and actually lift up off the grill, and it will release itself. Now, I'm going to cook this steak until it's about sort of rare to medium rare. OK, another little look in here. See what's going on now. OK, good. I got a beautiful uh, color going on. Nicely marked, and the lovely ridges coming from the grill pan. Pretty happy with the way that's looking at this stage. Now, I can sprinkle on the salt and black pepper. So what I like to do, sometime around now, and this is easier said than done, just hold it there for a few minutes like that, 
to allow that, that fat to just crisp up and to render some of the liquid fat out of that. Well, that's great. Now, the ideal scenario with the steak is never to take it straight from the pan to eat it straight away. Allow it to rest. This will benefit from a minimum of five minutes resting up to a half an hour. So I've got my plate ready here, a deep plate, slightly deep like that, with an upturned plate in it. And the reason for that is that any juices that will inevitably come out of the piece of meat will run underneath and be trapped and we can pour those over the meat afterwards, but the meat is not sitting in its own juices. So I just want to keep it warm, okay, not hot, because if it stays hot, it will overcook. Our steak and chips are nearly ready and they will be delicious just as they are, but I'm going to elevate them with some delicious salsa verde and a fiery horseradish sauce. Coming up after the break, I will be making some wonderful thin almond biscuits inspired by a trip to California. Before the break, I prepared some potato wedges which are cooking away nicely in the oven. Then I cooked my steak just the way I like it and set it aside to rest. Now I'm going to make the two sauces that I'm going to serve with the steak. Salsa verde literally means green sauce. It's a combination of herbs and leaves and today I'll be using some rocket, flat parsley, mint and tarragon. I find that the mint and the tarragon give a slightly perfumed flavour to the salsa. If you wanted to, you could put all of the ingredients into a food processor, and that's fine. You get a pretty good result, but I find when you do it by hand, um, it's not quite so pureed and not quite so refined. And in that way, I find I get the individual flavour of the sharper ingredients like the anchovy and the caper, and they help to cut through the richness of the meat. So that's the green taken care of. Next up, some anchovies, and you'll want to chop these finely. That's about it. You get little flashes of that flavour, and that's going in. Then my capers. Again, I'm going to just give these a little coarse chop because I want the, the sharpness, as I said, the acidity of those. So this is robust for sure. You know, lots of strong flavours going on. Now add a few dollops of French mustard. Crushed garlic, like that. Now, a little zest of lemon to freshen everything up. That should do it. And then a good glug of olive oil, again, extra virgin olive oil. Now, let's give it a stir, like that. And you see it coming into a paste. Make sure to mix through the mustard properly. So just a little taste like that. Mm, it's delicious not going to take any salt because of the anchovy, the mustard and the capers. So that's it, that's ready. So, starting off, I've got my softly whipped cream, just slightly runny cream in here. And I've got my vinegar and my lemon juice in here already. And also a pinch of English mustard powder because I like the heat of that. Um, a pinch of salt, unusually a pinch of sugar. Not to make it taste sweet, because that would be really disgusting, but it lifts the flavour of the horseradish. Twist of black pepper. And the other absolutely crucial ingredient, my horseradish. So what you do is you just, I've given a little scrub, and then with a vegetable peeler, you can see it peels easily to reveal this beautiful sort of ivory coloured flesh. And it's a lovely, hot, wonderful, pungent root. It's so good with so many different things. So, a little bit of lemon on my uh, microplane, it doesn't matter, it's all going in. You'll notice when you're grating the horseradish that it obviously releases the lovely aroma and scent from it. Sinus cleansing, um, purifying, almost sort of flavour. Okay, that could easily, I think, be described as an enthusiastic amount of horseradish. So let's give it a stir. Okay, that looks really good. Let's have a little taste. Yeah, perfect. Really good balance of heat from both the horseradish and from the mustard. And the little bit of sugar is not instantly obvious, but it's just lifted the flavour. OK, these look as if they're, yeah, lovely and crispy, like that. Perfect. 
Remember, at this stage, we need our pinch of salt. It's worth noting, no surplus fat here. So the small amount of olive oil we use just to glaze them or moisturise them lightly was sufficient amount to make them all lovely and crispy. Salt like that. Just slide them in there. I mean, those on their own, with another drizzle of olive oil or dipped into cold butter would be absolutely fantastic. Our steak has been resting. Now, when I'm serving a steak like this, this is a treat. This is a big deal because it's not going to come particularly cheap, but it's worth it. And this sort of fabulous Irish quality assured beef, you know, should be treated as a treat. Any little juices that have run out of the meat while it's been resting, I like to pour those over. They're delicious. Another wonderful accompaniment to this meal is a simple green salad tossed in a light vinaigrette. And that's that pretty much ready to go to the table. We have everything we need to make a really beautifully balanced meal, a superb piece of beef, our potatoes to go with, which are lovely and crispy and full of flavour. And of course, not forgetting the lovely salsa verde and the horseradish cream. Just a marriage made in heaven. When I worked as a chef, I was lucky enough to spend time in the kitchens of Chez Panisse in California, presided over for more than 40 years by one of America's most inspirational chefs, Alice Waters. And it was there that I learned how to make this biscuit, which I'm going to show you now. I find with a good biscuit, it's so much more interesting for me than a fluffy cupcake. And in the case of a biscuit, it's acceptable to have a second or even a sneaky third one. I love how something as simple as a biscuit can be so unbelievably sophisticated. The recipe is very straightforward. I've got some water and some butter in my saucepan here, which I'm going to melt. And the predominant flavour in this particular biscuit is cinnamon. So I'm going to pop that in there. So we're going to heat this just to melt the butter and the water. And this is going to bind our dry ingredients together. So Cook it on a lowish heat, because what you don't want this to do is to boil, really, because you don't want to boil the butter, and you certainly don't want to evaporate the liquid, because then your proportion of liquid to dry ingredients will be somewhat different. So let's get this on. There we go. In the meantime, let's look at our other ingredients. In my bowl here, I've got my flour sieved, and I've got a little bit of bicarbonate of soda or bread soda, and that's just going to give a little rise to the biscuits, and that will cause the mixture to bubble and just get a little bit of air in there. Again, with bread soda or bicarbonate soda, I pretty much always like to pass it through a sieve to be sure that there are no lumps, and then that's just give that a stir around. So that's ready there. I've got some flaked almonds. Do have them fairly finely chopped or sliced? And you'll see the reason for that a little bit later on. And the other ingredient then is some uh, soft brown sugar like that. OK, that's ready. The butter is melted and the cinnamon is mixed through nicely. Perfect. Now, turn off the heat. So add in the sugar into the liquid ingredients. Stir in the sugar until it's completely dissolved. Once you've achieved this treacly texture, pour your mixture into the flour. Then our flaked almonds. And then mix it all together. And it should come into a thickish sort of mixture. So you have to just work a little bit hard at this stage. That's looking sort of exactly as I'd expect it to look. OK, that's it. That's the consistency, thick like that. So I'm now ready to form that into my rectangle. So parchment paper, parchment is great because you're pretty much guaranteed it's not going to stick. So I like to sort of form it into a rectangle. You can make these whatever size you want. So that's enough to get me going with one slab. And then I just flatten it out like that. It's not a thing of beauty at this stage, that's for sure, but don't worry, all will be revealed. And then just push it to make the shape more formal, right into the edge like that. So we've got what one could vaguely call a rectangle there, and then just wrap it. And again, sort of compacting it as I go. So fold up the ends, getting it neat like that. And then this is going to go into the freezer until it's completely frozen. 
My biscuit mixer is frozen, as you can hear clearly, from the sound it makes. So just unwrap the parchment. Again, the joy of the parchment is that it's not going to stick. So what we're going to do is to cut thin sticks, if you like, of the mixture. And what I like to do then is to leave a little space between them, because they do expand slightly. So you've got these little thin sliced slivered almonds just flecked through the biscuit and then flavoured with the cinnamon. It's a really good combination of flavours. The problem about these is once you have one, you want another one and possibly another one again after that. But it's a really, really convenient thing. OK, that's it. They are ready to go into the oven. So I've preheated my oven, which is so important for any of these things. I'm going to pop that in and they'll cook in about 10 minutes. OK, I think my biscuits must be nearly cooked. Let's have a look. Right. OK, perfect. So they've caramelised lightly and sort of crisped up. And even if you touch them, they're still a little bit soft. So what I like to do at this stage is to slide them, and this is not as difficult as you'd think, to slide them in one go off the tray, still attached to the paper. You could, of course, serve these on their own. As I said, the primary purpose of a biscuit, generally speaking, is to have it with a cup of tea or coffee, something like that. But I'm serving the biscuits really as dessert in this particular meal. And I'm going to combine them with some lovely ripe pears. With pears, you need to think a couple of days ahead. So buy the pears two or three days ahead. Keep them on your kitchen counter so they ripen up nicely. I also have a little bit of cheese here that I'm going to serve with this to sort of complete the trio. And this is a beautiful cow's milk cheese called Coulet, which comes from West Cork. And this is a matured one. And the nutty caramel almost flavour of the cheese, it sounds like a strange thing to say in terms of a flavour of a cheese, that will pair brilliantly with the pears, if you'll forgive the pun, and also with the biscuits. Right, I'm going to put my biscuits onto this little glass sort of bonbon dish. It also has a glass cover, which you might think is completely over the top but there's something about lifting the dome on, off, off a dish that it makes everything sort of special. The crispy, cinnamony biscuits, the lovely nutty cheese from West Cork and the pears, a perfect combination of flavours, easy to achieve and delicious to eat.